This is the Business of College Sports podcast with your host, the founder of businessofcollegesports.com, Christy Dosh. Find her on Twitter and Instagram at Sports Biz Miss. Welcome to the Business of College Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Dosh, the Sports Biz Miss. And today we have a return guest. Wesley Haynes is the CEO of the Brandar Group. And we had him on last year as NIL was really kicking off to talk about group licensing. His agency, the Brandar Group, they create group licensing programs with universities and licensees and student athletes so that we have things like jerseys and shirts. Uh, trading cards, video games, those types of things. And a lot has changed since the first time that we talked and group licensing is far more established now than it was during our first episode together. And so I asked Wesley to come back and give us an update on group licensing. So without further ado, here is my interview with Wesley Haynes. Wesley, welcome back to the Business of College Sports podcast. Thank you. It's great to be with you again, Chrissy. We don't have many guests come on twice, but NIL is changing so fast, and I feel like it has been an eternity since you and I first talked about group licensing. You have so many more school partners now, and I know a lot has happened since we talked about this last year. So thank you for coming back for a part two. Oh, it's my pleasure. I can't wait to, to tell you a little bit about what's going on and to hear a little bit from you about um, about your group and uh, your your listeners' interests. So when we talked last time, I, I know we talked about UNC and Ohio State and some of the group licensing they'd done. And I can't remember off the top of my head, but I want to say when you and I recorded before, maybe you were at a dozen schools. Do you know off the top of your head about how many schools you're partnered with now? Yeah, we're at about 75 schools now. Uh, so we've been busy the past uh, year to 18 months. So we're super excited about it. And we've got some more that we hope to announce here in the next couple of days. And so we're just, we're tickled that schools are kind of entrusting this opportunity with us. And uh, I think they're going to see some neat things. They already are seeing some neat things. And I think they'll see more here in the next coming weeks and months and years. I know it probably looks different from one school to the next, but can you give us kind of a 10,000 foot view of what group licensing has looked like so far? Yeah. So, you know, you almost have to take a look when we talked, uh, we were just getting this thing rolling. And so we had just started education on those dozen or so campuses, getting student athletes opted into the program. Uh, we, we learned a lot in that frankly, the kind of questions that we would get asked many times from parents, from agents. Mm -hmm. um, and then we would usually do education on campus about what group rights mean to school administration or athletic administration people. So, um, you know, from our perspective, um, it, it went, it, you know, it, yeah, and one other point I guess I should make is we were coming out of the pandemic. And a lot of us don't like to talk about this, but it's the reality there were more supply chain issues than I think any of us realized. So we and our company kind of thought that September 1 began year one. Everything that happened prior to that was year zero. And we lucked out in the case of Ohio State. They had some blank jerseys. Um, uh, one of their retail partners, Legends, had some blank jerseys. And so we were able to get some some neat things going. And frankly, they, they were great test case, mm -hmm. um, data case studies for retailers. Uh, and so we were able to learn some things about what worked. Um, retailers were able to verify, hey, consumers are interested in this product. And what are the price points? And how do, you know, how do I best order because we don't know if Johnny or Sally are going to have a great year. And, and so, um, you know, how much do I want to stock up on individual athletes blanks versus making uh, customization available and, and yeah. you know, trying to follow the lead of the fans. So we've learned a lot. I will tell you um, the difference in where we are today versus uh, where we were when you and I last talked is pretty monumental. <laughs> what has been, 
I don't know whether to say the most popular or the most lucrative or how you want to measure it. What has been the most successful form of group licensing so far? Is it jerseys or I know jerseys are big too, um, but you've done so many different things. Is there any one thing that really stands out as, okay, this is definitely where group licensing can be successful? Yeah, you know, so, um, and I'll, I'm going to answer your question, but, but I would tell you that in the future, I think the group licensing is likely to touch most of the, the collegiate industry. So when we're talking to school administration or athletes, you know, we oftentimes say if, if you watch the NFL, you know, uh, you see group licensing in advertising campaigns. You see it on the products. You see it in the video games. Um, and so I, I would kind of flip it on its head. And I, I personally believe that it's going to touch most aspects of the college business. And, um, you know, when, right now we have a little over 70 licensees that we're working with. Most of those licensees are national in scope, meaning that through CLC or through the school, they've got uh, school IP rights to multiple schools. And so it's more of a national program and about 20 or so are kind of local licensees working with one or two schools in a local market. Um, and so the, you know, the, the obvious answer are the Jersey programs and the t-shirt programs that you mentioned. And, and there's no question um, that, that that's going to have a huge impact on the college business for all intent and purposes. The Jersey programs were less than 2% of the business prior to NIL. And when you compare that to the professional sports, which it's 20 to 25 percent of the business, that, that's a pretty big sea change. And so jerseys are what people talk about. But frankly, it, it's starting to get interwoven into almost every aspect of the business. OK, so it sounds like there are a lot of different categories where group licensing has uh, taken off and can ultimately be successful. I remember when we were talking about this last time, Hanes brand is one of the brands that sticks in my mind that like jumped right in and they were all in. And I have had multiple schools now tell me about things that they're doing with Hanes brand. So it sounds like uh, this is going well for them. But what was that like in terms of getting the sort of buy-in from the licensees to want to test this out? Has that been increasingly easier to sell them on as we've gotten further into NIL? Yeah, I mean, frankly, <clears throat> and there, there is a, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a good reason <clears throat> that 2021 occurred the way that it occurred is that um, many licensees, um, because of the supply chain problems that we talked about before, they couldn't really jump in with the fee. Um, and, and so they were able to kind of ease into it. Um, and in the case of somebody like Kane's Brands, they were able uh, to do some consumer research. Um, and then uh, because they had had some success at retail and their consumer research backed up, um, some of the things that they imagine, like consumers are more likely to purchase more product. And, and if they're a fan of three or four players, they'll purchase multiple products. And, uh, and it causes them to come back more frequently and buy products. And, um, and so as we've had more and more success, and as retailers now are talking to their licensees about, hey, why aren't you bringing in um, some NIL uh, player related player plus school IP product. You know, I just think that's going to increase the health of the business. Um, it's going to bring more licensees to the table. Uh, we are still having to do some selling, frankly. Um, you know, especially some of the, some of the licensees who've never done professional sports, who only work in college. Uh, luckily for us, Haynes Brands and Champion had done some work in, in the professional sports ranks, and so it wasn't so foreign to them. Um, uh, you know, but but we build on each other in terms of success. Retailers are now, you know, some of the big uh, sporting goods retailers, and even some of the big box retailers are saying, "Hey, we're getting really good sell through. Mm -hmm. That's great." So that means that you'll order more next time, right? You order more teams, right? So, um, so it, it's a little bit of um, a chicken and the egg thing in that we had to have products, we had to have retailer buy-in, and then we've got to have success. And to build this the way that we all want it built, uh, those things had to happen, and they have their natural course. Frankly, it seems like you know we've been at this for a long time, but it's really only been a year. Uh, and, and so some of the licensee and retailer interest is pretty, 
pretty astounding. And and so what you've seen this fall with products in the market, it's got to be 10 or 20 times the amount of product we had last fall. Uh, I think it'll double or triple or quadruple again next year. Um, and I think that's just having a healthy market and, and making sure that um, the retailers have a chance to make money on these programs, which is important that they do. Uh, and then uh, they get more and more comfortable ordering more and more product because fans are buying the product. I know it's early in this NIL mm-hmm. era to make this comparison, but what does group licensing in college look like now compared to what we've seen in the pro? Does it follow a lot of the same trends? You know, that's a great question. <clears throat> and the truth of the matter is we don't know yet. We don't have enough data yet to answer that. We think that, but we don't know that yet. Yeah. Um, and, you know, will, you know, will they buy the same number of jerseys? I don't know. The demographic of a professional sports fan for the Jacksonville Jaguars is different than the Florida Gators. But there's enough similarities there that we think it's, it's going to be fairly close, but I don't have the data yet to back that up. <clears throat> You mentioned earlier that you're fielding questions from students, from their parents, from their agents. What are some of the most common questions that they're asking you about group licensing? Well, first of all, what is it and why does it exist? And how does this not impact my individual rights? How is it um, additive to what I'm doing? Um, You know, and so once we get through those questions and, and give them concrete examples of it, you know, usually we get a we get a pretty high acceptance rate. Um, frankly, you know, I've been pleasantly surprised with agents, their professional representation. You know, they ask a lot of detailed questions, like what type of rates, how, you know, what percentage mm-hmm. do you take, and, and how does that all work, and when do they get paid, and and those types of things, and how do they get paid, and and so um, just you know things that. Um, and questions that should be asked, you know, are getting asked. People are getting more and more comfortable with it, seeing how it operates. Um, I will tell you, even the other agencies out there and the schools are getting more and more comfortable with it. Um, you know, that we're not a rogue agency that's just going to go um, uh, try to do something afoul of your program and really understanding what the school wants to do with their brand and how this can augment those rights um, is really pretty critical to making sure that they, they hire us and get us to work for their student athletes. I know that one of the things I have seen out there on, on Twitter and in other places is questions over royalty rates for jerseys at the college level versus what people think those rates are at the pro level. And I, I'm just curious if you can tell folks who are listening how those rates are determined uh, and how this system sort of works. Sure. Well, Knowing that you're an attorney, the, you know, the first thing we ask ourselves is this fair market value. And, and frankly, the best place to look for fair market value is what do the pros get? Um, and how can we apply that to college? Remember, the pros also get a salary. The student athletes don't. The student athletes get a scholarship in many cases, not a salary. So, um, but we start always with what do the pros get and how can we, um, it, at a bare minimum, at least match that. And in some cases, I would make the argument that maybe they should get a little bit more. Um, and so that's where we start from. Uh, the fact that we've done this now for seven years, our resume was really built on doing this for the NFLPA and for mm-hmm. the NBPA and Major League Baseball Players Association and others. So uh, that's where it starts from, is, is that basic premise. Um, and, then, and then after that, what are the differences? Are you asking them to do something active, like promoting that product? Well, then that's a, that's a different, I've got a different answer for you. If it's completely passive use of their IP and their NIL, uh, or if it's something active where they have to sign an autograph or they have to do a social promotion or a personal appearance and, um, and so those are the kind of factors that go into making sure that we can defend that is fair market value. And, and I'm okay having that debate. Frankly, it's not an exact science, but that's where we start from. And I'm okay having that debate because uh, we have to have that debate with a licensee. Uh, and, and we have to have that debate with, uh, you know, with, 
the school's agency or the school itself about what what is fair market value. And, and so that's where we start from. That makes a lot of sense. The, you were mentioning autographs and it reminded me of something that you all did with UNC, which I think is the most creative sort of outside of the box idea I've seen for group licensing. And that was the subscription box you guys did last uh, basketball season with the men's and women's basketball players there at UNC. And I remember getting pictures and they were all in a room together. It looked like they were having a great time and they were signing, you know, posters and all sorts of different memorabilia that was going to go in these subscription boxes. And and I had Deja Kelly from UNC on my other podcast, uh, the Players Platform, and we asked her about the experience being part of that. And she thought that that was such a fun activation. And it was something she got to do with all of her teammates because they were all there together signing things. Um, and I'm just curious to hear if you remember a little bit about how that came together. And is that something we might see at other schools or was that unique to UNC? No, it is something that we're going to do at other schools. Um, in fact, literally this week we're doing uh, another autograph signing with Fanbox at UNC, uh, but we are talking to some other schools about it. You and I previously had a conversation even about a collectives, and some of the collectives have kind of embraced that idea as a way to um, get their partners to buy into the collective is to have autograph memorabilia um, delivered to them. And so we've been working hard to use that as one of our initiatives or some of the collectives for how we can work together to make sure that they get value um, and uh, give value back to their uh, donors and, and the collective. So I think you're going to see a lot of that kind of um, growing and a lot of new creative ideas coming out of that. Frankly, uh, I've been pleasantly surprised that um, I think that the, the memorabilia and collectibles area is one of those areas that can really grow exponentially in college. Um, and I, you know, kind of like the Jersey program that you and I talked about earlier, I think that that's, um, that's got a lot of room to be developed. Um, and so we're happy to be working with Terry and Fanbox, and I think they're doing a wonderful job, and our team um, looks is looking to expand that to a lot of other schools going forward. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about using it in the collective sense, but a lot of those membership based collectives have, you know, certain benefits at each membership level. And I can see where that would be a good fit with the subscription box if that was something you got at one of those levels. So I, I wasn't even going in that direction. But since we're talking about collectives, I asked you before we hit record, were you working with any collectives? Because as many listeners to the show know, I have spent a lot of time consulting with collectives and run a membership and a monthly call for collectives. And they ask me, a lot of licensing questions um, because they're interested in becoming official sponsors of the athletic department, but group licensing has come up a few times. So curious to hear from you what kind of conversations you've been having with collectives or where you think those good intersections are between group licensing and what collectives are trying to do. Yeah, and, and I think you and I agree that um, the you know, as, as, as this has started, uh, again, about 18 months ago now, collectives uh, were talked about early on, and there were one, two, three, four. I've had, a, 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 I think you know this, there are a couple schools that have got four or five collectives. <clears throat> and so we've, we've been really, um, um, I guess, hesitant, but also uh, really interested in the collective market and how can we get involved and how can we work with the collectives and who are the collectives um, and what determines a collective that is doing things the right way. And, and so really doing a lot of due diligence about the, the different collectives at, at each individual school. But, but frankly, I do think we're, we're ready now to start announcing some programs uh, with a few of the collectives who want to work in with group rights or won't like the fan box uh, idea for their membership. And if you get a membership level, a, then you get these autograph signed jerseys uh, and membership level B, maybe you get a, you know, a, an autograph poster. And so there's going to be different levels to that. But trying to provide them with services that they, they can use to help develop their membership program. Maybe they don't have the staff to create um, the packaging and the deliverable monthly deliverables uh, to, to their membership. And so. But the first thing for us was really to do due diligence and who's running the collective and how do they interact with the school and how do we ensure that they're doing things the right way? Um, because the last thing that any of us want to do is 
to step in um, and maybe work with a group that's not doing things um, consistent with NCA guidelines and, uh, and run afoul of, of any legalities there. So we've been really hesitant to jump in early, but now we're seeing in this latest NCA directive makes it pretty clear that they're going to be around. So we're all getting more comfortable with working with them. And, and, they will, and, and many do want to do it the right way. And those are the ones we want to work with. Would a collective have to be a licensee of the athletic department in order to do group licensing with you all? I, like I'm thinking through because some because some collectives have had an issue doing that or haven't been able to. In some cases, I know some have complained that they can't afford it. So if they wanted to work with you all and it was about, you know, Haynes brand licensed gear, but they're sending that out to their membership, would a collective need to be a licensee? Not necessarily in that case. If they're using somebody who's officially licensed by the school and then they get the, the player rights with us, not necessarily. Um, it just depends on how they want to use the IP, what um, you know, what's the context of usage? And mm -hmm. so people always like to get black and white answers, but there's just not a black and white answer to that question. It's what do you intend to do? Um, do you intend to be a reseller? Do you intend to provide this as a membership or do you intend to run some advertising trying to use the school IP? And, um, and so depending on their context of usage, the answer could be yes or it could be no. Okay. I think that's still helpful that it's not a hard no. So I think some collectives yeah. might have some creative solutions. Uh, they might want to run by you. So we'll make sure at the end, we tell people how to reach out to you all. Um, if staying on the fan box idea, cause I loved that so much, I mean, of all the things I've seen in NIL and I think about things that were creative and different and just unique things that I get pitched that fan box was one of my favorite things that I got pitched and have written about and use as an example. Are there other creative sort of unique group licensing things? Maybe I don't know of off the top of my head. What, what have you seen folks do? You know, I think when most people think about group licensing, we think jerseys, jerseys, you know, trading cards, the video games. Um, are there any other creative, unique kind of things you've seen so far in this space? Yeah, I mean, there, there are. And so we've worked with um, several corporate partners who want to utilize the group rights for uh, for either own packaging type uh, products um, uh, and and then also you know, uh, that, that want to promote, uh, the best, the best, uh, game experience. And they'll use student athletes in those types of social promotions. So nothing that kind of is top of mind, um, you know, that, that I would look at you and say, gosh, I've never seen this done before right now. Frankly, borrowing from the best practices of professional sports is a great way for this to occur. And so it's, it's each one of these programs are so unique for college, but they're not necessarily unique in the world of sports. Right. We talked before about the kind of questions that student athletes and their parents and their agents have had. But when I had you on before, we also talked about questions that athletic departments had because everybody wasn't embracing the idea of group licensing yet. And now you've gone from, I think, what was around a dozen partners last time we talked to now 70 something. So I think you're winning people over to your side. But are there still questions? Are there still hesitations uh, coming from athletic departments? And what are they? Yeah, they, I mean, look, there are. Um, you know, they, they just want to understand why do I need this? Um, and, you know, what are you doing that's different than a collective or that can be complementary to our collective? And what are you doing that's different than our multimedia rights partner? And, and how can it be um, uh, additive to what they're doing and putting these programs together? So it's just really macro understanding of it. Um, and, and frankly, you know, the last 18 months, you know, the, the cloudy water of the space has kind of gotten clearer. You know, the, this last NCA directive was pretty black and white. You can't really sit on both sides of the fence. You've got to, you've got to kind of pick your side. You can't be an agent of the, University and also be uh, an agent, you know, to bring bills to student athletes and, and vice versa. So, you know, I just think it's getting clearer. Um, and, and frankly, you know, I, I think that that's good for the health of the industry. Um, and I think that you're going to just see this continue to grow.
over time. Um, I, I really do feel strongly that way. And I, I think that what we know today are, and the bulk of what you've seen have been those licensing problems. And I think here, you know, we're hiring, you know, pretty heavily in the space is now how do we put together more and more sponsorship co-branded programs like we just talked about, where you use student athletes on packaging art to promote um, that particular sponsor of the school's brand. And then in the future, there's going to be, you know, other things. Can, can we, can we work with, um, you know, with any of the media sponsors and do they want to work with student athletes in the future? And how would that work? And, and then how is, um, you know, how is data going to work in the future? And so there's a lot of exciting and new areas to come. Um, and, you know, and, and even down to, you know, getting all of the clearances for NFTs has been, you know, a, a neat educational experience, especially when it gets to, you know, once we move beyond still photography and uh, content and, and video rights. And so you know, I just think this industry is going to continue to evolve. A couple of episodes ago, I had on Marty Ludwig from University of Cincinnati, and I got to know Marty well this summer. I went and spoke at a conference uh, with folks who work in licensing on the university side, uh, not on the athletic side of things. And that was interesting because normally I'm talking to someone in athletics and got to go talk to them about NIL and questions they're getting from their sponsors over on the university side. So Marty came on and talk, we were really talking about breaking down those silos uh, between the university and athletics and that particularly with NIL, there are going to be these opportunities for both the university side of licensing and athletics to benefit. Do you, do you run into any of that at all? Do you deal exclusively with athletics or are you also dealing with folks on the university side? Yeah, so, you know, I have to admit that has been the most interesting of all. Uh, what you what you go from is a coach or an athletics department who really wants to uh, see student athletes NIL usage. Uh, and then you go over to, you know, maybe somebody who's not closely aligned to athletics and there seems to be a lot of walls. And so what we've seen across the board has been, uh, athletics and the the university folks coming together to do what's right, and frankly, that takes time. and And there had to be clear guidance from the NCA and who do I work with, and is that company reputable? Is you know, or are they doing it the right way or the wrong way? And so Marty's right. Uh, first of all, Marty is unique because of his macro exposure, his macro knowledge, and knowing how to work. Um, how to work in that university environment, but also how to work with, with people like ourselves and and with um, with all of the Under Armors and Nikes and the data of the world. And so, yeah, that has really been a challenge, frankly. And and if if I'm honest about it, the most pleasant surprise has been the universities have been the biggest advocates for getting this going in a much much bigger way. Um, I, you know, I think that most people thought that. Um, some of the legislation was going to be to make universities treat the kids fairly. That hasn't been the case. I, I've found them to be the biggest advocates. Um, it's been really cutting through the clutter of the historical collegiate industry and how this new changing landscape is going to work with, with you know, with MMR companies or um, or some of those agencies uh, that are involved there. And I think that that's getting cleared up now. Um, and I think that um, now on campus and in athletics, they're getting together and trying to streamline this process. And, um, and, and that, that hasn't been easy because the athletic director can't always just tell that person to do what they're, you know, what they need to do. Um, so, you know, getting, getting more comfortable with how this operates and how you, the university is not losing control of your IP usage and, uh, and how it's always your brand and you always have a say over yes or no over anything that's done uh, has been critical. And and I, I think that education has helped us all. Yeah, Marty had, if, if folks didn't listen to that podcast, Marty had some uh, great advice for others who are working in his position on the university side or working over on the athletic side about ways that the, the two sides can come together and do better work together on behalf of, of student athletes and the rest of the student body. So 
Um, I'm not saying this just because it's my podcast, but I learned a lot from that episode. And I think uh, folks who work in the industry would get a lot out of some of his ideas. And uh, they've got some great stuff going on there at Cincinnati. Totally so that's, that's my plug for Marty. <laughs> no, I totally agree. And frankly, there's still some universities that aren't even allowing group rights to occur on campus. Whether you work with us or whether you work with somebody like us, you, you need to be leaning in on this. Uh, it, 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 it will be here no matter what the federal legislation, let's say Congress does get their acting gear and does create some federal legislation. I think this part of the business survives. Um, some things will change, but I, I can't imagine this changing. Why? I mean, look, it's been in existence for 30, 35 years in professional sports. Um, it's actually a proven model that works. Is there anything you still would like to see the NCAA clarify? We, we got those latest clarifications. By the time this recording goes up, we'll be about two weeks removed from their latest set. But is there still anything help, uh, you know, in terms of your business that would be helpful for them to clarify? Yeah, you know, I think that, um, first of all, I really applaud this latest directive. I think that um, there was some areas of confusion and areas of ambiguity. And I think that they've cleared up a lot of that. Um, frankly, I guess the next, the next part of this is where, where does the teeth come in to make sure that, um, you know, that it's done correctly and that you hold people accountable to doing it correctly. Uh, but I really think that, um, you know, that this, this step was necessary. I think it's been confusing, um, and I think that they did the right thing, uh, and I really applaud it, frankly, um, which is kind of odd to say. So all of us kind of uh, saying they, they, they did right here. I think it was late, and I wish they'd have done it earlier, but I think that some of those directives were needed and necessary, and, and I think that they got it right. Now, you know, what does Congress do? Do they do anything? Do they get involved? Um, and and then how does that impact some of the state laws that have been put into effect? Yeah, still lots of uh, unanswered questions, but I agree with you. The latest set of clarifications I thought was helpful and the sort of, you can do this, you can't do this. Like, the, you know, they had columns with bullet points, the do's and don'ts. I thought they broke it down really nicely. And I only had a few things where I needed clarification on the clarification. And uh, <laughs> Linda Teeler at University of Florida, who's the chair of that working group, was nice enough to jump right on the phone with me and answer those questions before I published my article on it. So I'll put that in the show notes for people if you want to see all those do's and don'ts. Um, but I, I think they did really nice work on this. We so rarely say, uh, you know, so many nice things about the NCAA in one uh, podcast episode, but uh, they, they did a nice job with this one. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. So look, you know, let's give them the credit here. They, they did do, uh, they did do the right thing here. And I think that those uh, directives were needed and useful. Yeah. Let's end on this note, which is from a group licensing perspective, what should we all sort of keep our eye on or look forward to? Where are we going from here? So first, I think that uh, you're going to see more and more universities um, embrace this. And so it's just going to get bigger on the consumer product side. The next big evolution is going to be doing this in mass on the sponsorship side with the, with the multimedia rights uh, entities. And then the last component of it, I think, will be some of the new generational types of opportunities out there and, and you know, working with um, data and or working with content and how, and then working with even with some of the media entities out there and how, um, and I'm not talking about um, being involved with media rights fees. I'm talking about agent. I'm talking about sponsors who want to utilize student athletes um, and, and as being uh, spokespeople or being in campaigns. And I just think that that's going to uh, gradually evolve um, and, and move forward in a positive way. So, you know, it's really about maturing and doing it at a healthy pace um, because it's, again, we're not really reinventing this. It feels that way um, yeah. because we're pushing water uphill, but we're really not. It's really trying to borrow from these best practices that we've seen uh, across all of the landscape of sports and now put it into practice here in college. And, uh, you know, and, and frankly, you know, I, I really want to work to empower student athletes. Can we give them 
um, use of some of their content and can they have the opportunity to be uh, to put their own programs together and so I can't wait to see how this evolves um, you know it's pretty exciting and and frankly I appreciate all of the the leagues and the union partners talking to us about it as well and, and giving us helpful hints on what we should and shouldn't be doing and what we should and shouldn't be focusing on. Um, but, but frankly, I, I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more excited about where this is at. Well, thank you for coming back and giving us a, another update in this space. We'll have to have you on again when we get a little further down the road because I, I agree with you. I think that this is an area that's going to continue to grow and develop. And uh, I look forward to continuing to get press releases from you all and learning about what you're doing and seeing what you have coming up. Um, and I'm going to be watching out for that next UNC fan box because I loved that idea. <laughs> good, good. Well, I can't wait for you to see the next one. Thank you, Wesley. All right. Take care, Chrissy.